Okay, Amanda, we're good to go. Okay, we'll call the meeting to order at seven o'clock sharp. Um, we'll start with roll call. Okay, Mary Ann Banks. Here. Natalie Drozda. Here. Andrew Grove. Let's click the attendees real quick. Let's see, Andrew. Uh, Pat King. Here. Tom Langston. Here. Amanda Ross. Here. Tom Sufchuk. Here. Mike Wallen. Here. And Pat West. Okay. Um, I'd also like to welcome Sam Everhart. He's our new youth commissioner. He's here observing. Welcome, Sam. It's very exciting stuff happening yeah. tonight. A lot of people here tonight. This is <laughs> This is not typical. A lot of people online and a lot of people in the back. So get excited here. Sam's official role is junior board member. So um, I think this lasts, how long does it last? I think it's just this semester. So. Just this semester. Yeah. Okay. So stand up and tell us a little bit. Tell you the work. Um, so I'm a junior here at um, my little high school. I play hockey. That's the big part of my life. Um, this summer, I was a counselor at Camp Conakwee, if any of you guys are familiar. That was an awesome thing for me. And since then, I've been really trying to get involved, so I thought this would be a great opportunity to do that. So, thank you guys. All right, next up is the minutes. Um, the minutes are in your packets. Uh, if we just have a motion in a second to approve the minutes from last month. I'll move to approve two little typos that are not worth sweating. Your name? Yeah. <laughs> I've seen it. Sort of. Oh, you missed to see it. It's easy to do. And then... Uh, uh, Oikos Ecology is spelled with a K, no O I K O S. Okay, um, so should how about the motion to approve as amended? Did you make that? Motion? Move we approve as amended. Second, second. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the minutes are approved. Um, next up is citizens' comments. It looks like we have a lot of people. We'll start. And not at, sometimes people just want to listen. They're not here to say anything. So we're going to start with people here in person, and then we'll move to people that are waiting online. You get five minutes. Five minutes. Please state your name and your address for the record. Um, and this is recorded um, for people to watch or to listen to. Later. So if anybody in the back wants to yeah. come up and speak, your, go ahead up to the podium. And again, your name, your street, and we will time you and let you know when your five minutes are up. And also, just so you guys know, we listen to you, and then like it moves on. We move on with yes. the meeting. Yeah, just so you know, there's there's not like dialogue or thank you. Okay. Um, I'm Brittany Florian. I am live at four four five Avon Drive, and I am a first and second grade Malibin Youth Cheerleader Coach. Um. We want to be respectful of your time, so we kind of organized, we gave you the handouts of what we're hoping to do. After much time back and forth, this is my first year with it, the organization, Mount Lebanon Youth Cheerleading Organization. Um, from my limited experience back and forth, there have been nothing from the board. I've tried to do board meetings, board minutes, all of these things. The women that are up here with me, um, have been in it a lot longer. And ultimately, we can't get anywhere with them. So because we are, you, Mount Lebanon Youth Cheerleading is partnered on the Mount Lebanon website as a partnership, we're hoping that you all can hopefully help us. Um, our goal is to provide equitable access to cheer in Lebo. So that's to provide standards of accountability regarding registration, finances, communication, standards, processes for electing new officers, and policies related to attendance. We have factual support of statements, um, facts that will be presented by my cohorts. Um, we have various concerns that have been raised by multiple different parents from different ages, first through second, all the way to fifth through sixth. They are not being met by the board and Again, we're hoping you can help us. Um, others have tried time and time again to email, to discuss, to talk to them, and nothing is coming. So 
we met with one board member who said she doesn't have any control. She has to talk to the president and we've heard nothing back from that. Our four primary categories we wanna talk about are transparency from the board, communication, not following bylaws and the equitability or the equity over everything. So here I will. Sorry about that. My name is Kara Mannion and I live at 348 Atlanta Drive. I am the mother of the lone male cheerleader in the rec department who's also on the comp team. And um, I'm going to talk about our concerns about transparency and communication. Um, there was zero transparency with respect to how teams were assembled and assigned this year which was a change from previous years and not disclosed to any parents or participants before, during, or after registration. There was a lack of consistency with respect to school, grade, year, and experience. Um, there was also a lack of transparency because there was an undisclosed early admission process for perfect attendance last year which put new cheerleaders and anyone else who wasn't given said information at a disadvantage, and that created a serious wait list issue. It was also not consistently administered, so there were cheerleaders with perfect attendance last year who were not offered. There were people with not perfect attendance who were also offered that. Um, the cheer board was refusing for a number of weeks to provide any information about athletes who were placed on wait lists to participate, despite many requests for updates, insight, and many offers of volunteering from many parents in the community. Um, there was very inconsistent application of guidelines. Um, teams were supposed to be a one, two, three, four, and five, six. Um, but there was no explanation except that one team is three, four, three, four, and five, which meant those fifth graders lost the opportunity to be on the varsity squad this year, which is a big deal to many of our cheerleaders. Um, there's also financial transparency issues with not a lack of clarity about the use of funds in marked up uniforms, exchange of funds with a for-profit all-star cheer gym, a monthly financial shared with competition cheer program coaches. Um, in addition to the transparency, our communication concerns are significant. Um, there is not consistent communication with all coaches um, and coaches are not supposed to talk to each other regarding best practices um, or share knowledge or information and schedules are not available to different um, coaches of different teams. Um, some teams have a full schedule for the year posted. My son's team, it goes week to week. It was there and then it completely disappeared off Game Changer, which presents a significant problem for our family with making sure our son gets to all of his cheer games with other requirements, especially having a child with special needs who we plan around. Um, there's been no more explanation about the schedule, when it might arrive, um, or when it might change. Um, any posts made on the Game Changer app, which is to be the official communication, um, have resulted in unannounced remo removal from email lists and Game Changer. Um, parents and coach emails to the board um, were met with flippant responses. There were people specifically called out and singled out for um, not making it to a game for previous uh, things, but there have been multiple parents raising issues, but no responses from anyone on the Mount Lebanon Youth Board. Um, many um, members have complained about the unprofessional nature of some of the group correspondence, including um, when they singled out my son's coach um, by name and blaming him, blaming that coach for um, some of the concerns that were raised, which were not related. Um, there are social media posts on Mount Lebanon youth cheerleading, which are not appropriate and not reflective of what 
our children should be seeing and experiencing. Um, and um, there have been two examples of specific lying saying that they reached out to flag football to try to get our extra squads to cheer and saying that um, they didn't get a response uh, from flag football. The early admission registration, which was later promised on perfect attendance, that was not the case. It was not, didn't happen. Um, and stating that the JV white squad was all the waitlisted girls, which it's not because my son's a boy and he's on that team, um, to appease the parents who had complained about the process. Thanks for everybody's time. I'm gonna touch briefly in the last two areas. Oh, I'm sorry. Jennifer Minter, I live at 798 Scrub Grass Road. I am assistant coach for the competition team and I have a fifth grade cheerleader. Okay, so touching on the last two buckets, the first <clears throat> being corporate governance issues and concerns. We, um, parents have determined that the Mount Lebanon Youth Cheerleading Association has lost its 501c3 status for failure to submit three years of 990 forms. Um, we've heard nothing about that from the, the board. Um, we've received as a group for multiple years now, no notice or disclosure of when board meetings are to occur or when they've happened. We've been refused requests to provide historic minutes from board meetings. Um, the bylaws for the organization were last year unilaterally amended to remove references to members of the organization, i.e. The, the parents and caregivers, from having any say or vote on any matters relating to the organization, including election of board members and officers, thus allowing the current members to serve in perpetuity um, with no mechanism for new volunteers to serve at the board level. And um, an example of that, the treasurer last year um, quit the board and multiple parents had reached out um, asking when the election would occur for the new treasurer because a number of parents were interested in serving and they were told that the position had already been filled by a person whom to our knowledge is not a resident of Mount Lebanon and has no children in the program. Moving on to equity. We're requesting clarity surrounding attendance and required components and revisions to policies to ensure that they are in line with the other Mount Lebanon rec programs, um, which there currently aren't based on parents having children in a plethora of other programs. Um, there's concerns regarding um, patently lopsided schedules where some teams were assigned nothing but away games at Cannon McMillan and Thomas Jefferson while the equivalent grade team received nothing but home games, um, which obviously can be problematic for a number of reasons and seem to be retaliatory in some degree. Um, unilaterally deciding as the season began that the off weeks were, instead of being off weeks, going to instead be a mandatory practice at a pay to play cheer gym in Baldwin, where the staff was coaching the cheerleaders. There was no insight given into the financial nature of that, and no waivers were signed in connection with this practice, which raised concerns by parents as well. Um, inequities associated with the previously mentioned um, undisclosed early admission process where select families were told of the ability to register before the portal officially opened, and then the portal closed two hours after opening, um, leading to panic. Um, Two other items, there's a Baldwin cheer competition, which this year it was unilaterally decided to choose one squad to participate, which the squad happens to have a board member for a coach. Um, there's been no disclosure of fees, no attempt at equity or inclusion of other cheerleaders at the same grade level who may be interested in participating. And um, there's another instance where that same team got invited to cheer at a pit game and none of the other squads were afforded the same opportunities. So what we would ask the board to assist us with, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, two more things. Inequity with respect to uniforms for female athletes versus male athletes versus non-binary children. There's some concerns there. Um, so what we're looking for assistance with is um, looking at the current bylaws and ascertaining whether material or revisions were done in accordance with the nonprofit rules and governance standards investigating the revocation of their 501c3 status um, and the status of the current officers and how they were appointed, 
and then asking MTLYCA to post historic board minutes and prospective board meeting times and places to the cheerleading association email chain and on their website, including the November meeting at which board members would be elected. So we would ask for your assistance on this by um, sometime in the fourth quarter before the next uh, Parks and Rec board meeting. And if the board refuses to engage on these issues and address Mr. those three Chair, items. Yes, yeah, yeah, the, the Mount Lebanon board, sorry. We would ask that MTL YCA have their partnership with Mount Lebanon revoked and that a new MTL youth cheerleading organization and competition team be partnered with effective as of January 1st of next year after our current season concludes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anybody else in the room here to make a statement? If you're if you are, you're welcome to go to the podium and state your name and address. Yeah. Are we allowed to comment on that? Or no, I think we're gonna move on. Yeah. Are we permitted to? Um it, no. And we're gonna just take their comments and we can talk, discuss yeah. it at another sure. Sure. at another time. Well, or growth phrase briefly a new business. Anybody else in the room? Okay, anybody online would like to speak? Um, looks like Tracy has her hand raised. Again, state your name and address, please. And you have five minutes. Oh, you got Hi, folks. My name is Tracy Riggle Young. I live at 945 Old Hickory Road. I just wanted to say to the group today, we know that you all do not currently govern the Mount Lebanon Youth Cheer Association, but we're hoping that bringing this issue to you will help us bring some resolution also, we feel it speaks to the need to create an umbrella organization to govern youth sports in Mount Lebanon. We need a way to create standards of accountability for our youth sports programs. We need a place to come where we can come together to create best practices to help our volunteer leaders of these organizations. And we're hoping that the Parks and Recs Board can help create a structure where there are standards and easy on ramps for folks who want to step into positions of leadership. So again, we have immediate concerns about the cheer program um, mm -hmm. as it to our youth in Mount Lebanon, but we really feel that this speaks to a larger need to standardize how we deal with youth sports in Mount Lebanon and are just grateful to you all to help us figure out um, what shape that may take. That's all I have. Thanks, Tracy. Anybody else online, you can hit the raise your hand uh, button and we'll know that you want to speak versus just listen. Okay, looks like that would be the end of citizens' comments. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to the chairperson's report. There is no report. Um, the commission liaison report, Craig is not here this evening. So did you get a report from him at all? I did not. Okay, same. Um, staff liaison report. Yeah, I'll uh, start on the handout one you guys have here. Um, we finally got all of our park and ID signs from our vendor. Um, so those, I'll uh, start putting in one calls and then um, our crews will put them in. We're quite capable. Um, so as that goes, you'll start to see those standard park ID signs. Um, we'll get the fence mount ones for Dixon Middle Seymour. Uh, bird soccer will have one uh, for John Dr. Field at the lot, uh, in addition to the um, entrance signage for Bird Park. So that's kind of cool. They they came in and they they look awesome. Nothing was scratched. There's touch up paint. There's backup vinyl decals to put on if something gets scratched, hit by a mower, you know, anything anything like that. That um, so we're we're kind of we're ready to get rolling on that finally. So um, the parks uh, planting order. Um, how I worked that in is that when we order street trees for the, our street program, there's over 12,000 street trees through Mount Lebanon that we um, plant, prune, remove, replace. That's kind of the, the program as it goes. I sneak um, anything I need for park planting into that order. It saves upwards of almost $1,000 on shipping, considering these come from New York, um, other nurseries like that that uh, we outsource from. So we'll be doing some planting in... Um, Williamsburg, uh, replacing one, one or two um, dead ones from that original planting, adding kind of the next wave of understory through there. Uh, and that'll be a multi-year process to get that 
um, you know, parked back to a fully wooded one. Um, I know that's a, a popular asset of that, that little neighborhood park. Um, sticking a couple in in Rockwood, Iroquois, Rob Hollow. Um, we'll grab the guys after they get through done, uh, doing the street tree program, they'll move right into planting parks and trees. Anything that needs spring dug um, for sensitivity of planting, your oaks and everything like that, we'll do that in the spring as well. So there's kind of two waves of uh, park planting that go on each year, just so you guys know. Um, over at Main Park, just real quick, had to take a piece of uh, equipment on the two to five H out of service. Our vendor's awesome there. Parts are already ordered. As soon as we get them in that piece, we'll be back. Um, it's amazing how uninterested all the kids are in all the other equipment when you have grinders and drills and stuff in the middle of the park. They just, <laughs> they just come right there and the parents love it. So it's, it's, um, it's all good. Um, uh, we've got two, two donor benches we're going to be installing in uh, Spalding Circle. I've uh, been working with a, a local family on that. Um, so they'll have nice bronze um, plaques incorporated, uh, cement base underneath to keep the uh, string trimmers, mowers from damaging them. Um, the company we've been using for this standard of benches has warranted a bench for me that's over three years old, which is past the warranty that's on the product label. So we're, we're pretty happy with this. And um, the vendor works with us and knows the kind of importance of, of um, partnering with us for that. Um, uh, Icon Law Landscape are dollars associated for invasive removal throughout the park. Um, I met them last week. They got, they got all their field maps. They made a blitz through everything. Um, they had great comments on Lower Bird, where a um, stream, uh, the PA American Water Grant project went through down there. Um, they almost found nothing to do retreats on. So they said bravo to those involved down there. That was uh, the best they've seen it going through. So, um, and I usually work alongside them that week. Um, Conservancy goes out, marks uh, all the tree ahead and they can find. Um, and then I come through and treat it for them. And that's your post plant for our friendly lantern bugs that are everywhere. So theory is if you, if you knock that, um, you know, food source out and host tree for them, maybe they'll move on through your area. So I know you might be thinking I'm a liar as you probably stepped on 300 coming here. So, um, but we're, we're going to keep on that over, uh, on the fields, um, got a good relationship with soccer this year over on Brafferton. Um, with that added square footage from converting the infield art, we're rotating fields, um, seeding goal mouth areas, aerating as they change their configuration. So hopefully that leads to better uh, play for everyone and just better field conditions overall. So that's working out well. Um, and we're just kind of going with the same approach over at Bird um, and with Dixon having to share that outfield with soccer. Um, David's guys are great about letting me know when they're moving things around. We come in behind them. Um, so we're, we're constantly um, throwing seed, opening that soil back up to make sure that we can try and keep the healthiest, you know, standard turf for um, all your little ones out there playing. So that is something we do try to keep up on. Um, added some additional asphalt walks down at Brafferton and some muddy spots, the approach to the field, um, connected that access road over to basketball, makes all the sense in the world. Um, da -da -da, went through our, our normal... Um, grooming of uh, the synthetic field of Middle and Seymour. Um, we also uh, have a hundred pound magnet that we pull behind that and we pull out some crazy things from that field, but in a good way, because nobody's sliding or diving into them. So you get, you get cleat inserts, bobby pins, stuff like that. Any, um, any trying to think the craziest thing, cell phone, like we pulled up like parts of a cell phone one day, but it, it's good that that stuff, um, that we keep up on that and that stuff comes out. Um, and Finally done with the bleacher upgrades everywhere and operating budget for next year as a service level. Um, if it's uh, selected, we'll, we'll go ahead and change out the rest of that seating over towards Seymour. Um, also working with um, baseball and the Seymour Foundation uh, to see if there uh, might be an opportunity for, for funding um, for a larger grandstand maybe baller rated planners, something to kind of address that batting cage up area over there. So, but we're being cognizant of the parks master plan that's going on, making sure we're not buying assets that are going to be moved around for configurations. But um, I don't think any of the concepts that have been in front of commission show that turf field going anywhere. So um, we'll just look to improve that area, but um, let me know if you have any questions, you have my email, you see something out of line, 
Poison Ivy, thank you. Uh, we'll you get it. Left it <laughs> I get it. There's there's a lot of one, in that bush one, leaning over like one that. One hanging out, yeah. But yeah it's my mine. daughter pointed it out. So. Did she touch it or did she just point it? Out? No, she she knows what it looks okay, like. Okay, good. So. That's good. Um, so please email me anything you got. Um, we'll we'll get to it as quickly as you can. So. Quick question yeah. about Bird Park. Yeah. Um, I think you've been in contact with some coaches about dog poop on the soccer field. Yes. Do you think this, so for everybody who knows, the middle school boys and girls soccer bird park is their home field. So that means they host games from outside communities and they've had a lot of problems this fall with dog poop on the field. So other teams from other communities show up to our park and are welcomed by a giant pile of dog poop in the middle of the field or on their way to the field. Not a good look for Mount Lebanon. Um, is there anything we could do to announce to people? To, to, you think, does it matter? It will make a difference if we tell people this is a sports field that there were people from out of town are coming in and this is the look we're showing them to prevent them from letting their dogs do whatever they want to do? Uh, the reaction to that, if you're down in the park and you see it, is is 911 non emergency, ask for animal control. Okay. Um, I believe that's how that would be handled. Uh, um, we have have had, uh, because one is currently missing at the far end, um, signs that say no dogs on the field at what I think are your token entrances, sure. off trailheads, off the access road. Um, Bird Park is a leash dog, you know, a loud park, obviously. But it's also um, sort of the unspoken dog park in Mount Lebanon. Yes, we, we've, we've all seen that if we've right. walked down that way. So uh, we have another sign to go in the far corner to replace the missing one. Okay. Um, not that that does anything right out of the gate. Um, <clears throat> I think just word of mouth on that will help. Obviously, it's not a comfortable situation to approach, you know, anyone and say, you know, hey, get your dog off the field. Sure. Did you see the sign? It's like a Levo alert or something like that saying, hey, Mount Lebanon hosts games at Bird Park in the fall with other schools and please keep your dog off the... Does that, Matt, David, in your experience, does that make a difference? The people who are doing it don't care. The uh, ordinance says dogs are permitted on the park in a leash with the exception of the athletic field. Um, we've, we've put signs up. They've been removed. Um, there are people that just choose to disregard the rules about dogs on that field. And people be fined. I'm not sure what the, the penalties are for violating those rules, um, but no. animal control there. or police can Force. enforce them. Cameras that. installed there? Uh, That'll stop. Uh, there are uh, cameras that could be installed there, like portables that we put in uh, areas. Yeah. I also wonder if people are going to probably use this as a dog park sign or not. No sign, but maybe a, I'm being idealistic here. A sign saying, you know, basically, please you know, clean up after your dog and just sort of appeal to folks like, We'll sort of like know the dogs are going to be down there even though they're not supposed to be but for god's sakes folks we we even provide we have a full doggy pot station there that's yeah, docked yeah. and um we empty that out we restock those bags yeah. um so i think you're doing everything you can my only thought was like a lebo alert kind of situation where would that prevent at least people let people know that it's not just like mount lebanon residents you're doing this to people our guests of our community yeah. are being greeted with a pile of dog poop, literally. Yeah. <laughs> and figuratively. So, <laughs> um, okay. We'll move on. Well, just uh, real quick, a couple of oh, sure. For Bill. Um, on Twin Hills, first of all, I just want to sort of uh, express appreciation publicly to Pat Austin. So, I sent you some maps about the grid down trees and stuff. Yes. Twin Hills, and I know you guys, public works have probably been more than busy. After the storm of a couple of weeks ago, Pat, who lives at the corner of uh, Ridgeway or Ridgewood or whichever, and uh, Twin Hills Drive was out there with his chainsaw. So the trails are all reopened, so you can cross that off your, your list. That's a, a great effort on his part. Um, as you saw, Ron Block had marked up the trees of heaven and I just had my dog over there today. The, uh, the bugs, the spotted lanternflies are enjoying enjoying those. Um, any rough schedule for when those trees are coming down, or I don't. Know, but when they, if yeah, if they're cut right now and they're still 
viability in there. They'll shoot sucker taps yeah. up throughout. So it, it is a watch watch and wait type thing. It, honestly, it'll be in the spring to make sure they don't leaf back out. Yeah. Um, Cause all we'll do is spread them if we cut them and, and the uh, treatment didn't. Okay, so they're, they're built to cut in the spring? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm not bugging you to do it sooner. I'm just curious. Yes, yeah. Do you, yeah. Are you still able to treat more? If in case more yeah yeah just today i was in alfred lot along the t-tracks there it's all the little same nasty trees so um as those come in through um usually like mid-october um after that is kind of pointless um once the roots shut down and stop taking that uh, uh treatment down into there so and what about um ones on private property uh i I have a friend that had one growing in their yard they didn't know know about, and I was wondering if yeah the the township like owned, yeah and, and like I carry the applicator's license and, and that that is a um, very non vague line. If it is not on municipal property, then then it uh, cannot be done. But Google it, and there's there's a couple different tactics to go at it there. No, that was all. Okay. We'll move on to the subcommittee reports. We'll start with the pickleball subcommittee. Did you want to hear my report? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry. Thank you. Okay. It's because I didn't have it in writing. I was like looking through. Go ahead, David. That's I'm quite sorry. all right. I, I do not give a written report like Bill. Bill's um, okay. okay. good like that. Um, so I'll just briefly share some things with you. Uh, the pool is drained and uh, is being prepared for closing. The commission did approve um, hiring a consultant, Councilman Hunsaker, who will assist the municipality and gateway engineers to develop uh, design specs to replace the filtration system at the pool, as well as a few other upgrades. Um, so we'll be working hard on that. Um, and the plan is to have that up and running prior to the, to the next swim season. Uh, tennis courts five and six, uh, I think I've probably been saying for probably two meetings, they're nearly complete. They're still nearly complete. <laughs> uh, bubbles are scheduled to go up this Saturday. Um, I'm not 100% certain that we will sign off on courts five and six before Saturday morning. Um, so we may need to mobilize and bubble the third uh, enclosure at a later date. But um, we will at least get two bubbles up this Saturday, uh, weather permitting, uh, maybe three. If not, we'll get the other one um, shortly thereafter once the surface um, compacts and firms up enough to the point where we think it'll be ready to, to get the bubble and be, be playable all winter long. Uh, pickleball rules uh, have been updated, including the music uh, prohibition. Um, in addition to saying that it's going to end at 930, Phil has adjusted the lights to go off at 930. We're also clarifying um, that it shouldn't start before 8 a.m. So we're restricting from 8 a.m. to 930 p.m., um, new signs are being uh, prepared by our printer as we speak. We'll get those hung shortly. And I did notify everybody on the pickleball um, concern and complaint list and uh, received several very uh, positive and thankful emails. So um, that's uh, been handled. We'll get the signs up here, I think, probably within... Two weeks or less, I would say. Ho hopefully next week sometime. That's all. That's a good segue into the pickleball subcommittee report. Do you guys have anything? Well, nothing new unless Chuck Buttmeyer's here tonight or online. Yeah. No, you're right behind me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> sneaking, sneaking up on me. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if you have any questions. I yeah. Chuck, why don't you just go ahead and state your name and address just so we have it for the record, and then we could do a little Q&A. Um, Chuck Bittmar, I live at 226 Jefferson Drive. Um, I work for a company called Damo Sports. We've been in the pickleball business for 10 years. We were in tennis business for 40 years. I've been there 36 years. Um, it's five, I've been working with Dave for like five years trying to get pickleball in Mount Lebanon. So it's, it's, uh, it's nice to see. I see a lot of people playing there. Uh, I understand the issue with the noise and the music because 
you asked me to put that up on my Facebook saying I had a little bit of run in with someone over there when I went over to have them shut it down. Most of the people that were doing that stuff were non residents, though, so that's another issue. But as far as noise, <clears throat> I don't know if there's anything you can really do that is, wouldn't be cost prohibitive as far as sound mitigation. Uh, there are blankets that you put over the fence, there are various walls that you can put in. But one of the problems with North Bettercroft, it's below street level. So it's only the noise is only going to come up. So it's just going to, there's nothing unless you put it in, you know, closed in place other than that. Um, we as a company and many companies are trying to make uh, quiet pickleballs, quiet paddles. In fact, that's probably at the top of everyone's list to come up with that type of equipment. We're working really hard to do it. Paddles that have felt coverings, paddles that have softer cores. Uh, we met with people from CMU down at our tournament, which we held on the island. We're based here in Pittsburgh. We're down at Washington's Landing where they do the rowing. So we have pickleball course on the island. We're doing a 3D printed ball that's really quiet. Uh, we do a foam ball that's quiet. There's some communities that they're restricted to using that foam ball. Otherwise, there's no play at all. It's basically they're right within condominiums or townhomes and so forth. Um, when Tom called me, I just, the lights were, I suspected that were going to be a big problem because people will play until they're tired and they go yeah. off. And uh, eight o'clock is usually when most communities allow it to start, which is a good start as well. I have gone over there, driven by, I've seen people over there at 7 15, 7, you know, playing. But as far as noise, I don't, you know, they're very expensive. Some of the walls are hundreds, tens, tens of thousands. In fact, one of the foremost individuals that I know in the country, they, he's doing a lot of work with this stuff. He actually lives in Upper St. Clair. So uh, he's somebody that if you wanted to go further and get a little bit more just information, just to, he could help. I could get him involved if it came to that. Is that the, the uh, retired CMU professor who started the consulting firm? Or again? Well, he's the, I don't know. He's an engineer. I don't know if he's a senior, but he was an sound engineer. He does, he does testing. He does testing for the United States Pickleball Association because they're coming up with a quiet ball program. And there's, that'll be an approved program where that'll be certified as a quiet ball because the decibel level will be below 80. Mm -hmm. Most pickleballs are up decimal levels up around 90, 95. And then when you get a certain paddles, it's even louder. Um, what more can you say about the foam balls? That sounds kind of interesting. Do they play adequately or are they? They're the best option that if someone has to be able to play at all. And what we've done is we have foam balls now that are the same diameter as a pickleball and the same weight. So they can be used. You can play. It's a little bit different because you're missing the sound. If the ball will behave slightly different, probably get a little bit more spin. It could be a little bit faster, but it won't hurt anybody. So when it is faster, it's not going to hurt anybody. Are they expensive? Or? People were gone. Are they expensive? No. No, they're, they're, they're like $10 for three or something like that. But they last. And plus, you can wash them when they get dirty. You know, so some communities are requiring... Only that ball was there are communities that require only that ball. What's the reaction been to that? Uh, it's been positive because they want to otherwise the course sit empty. So there are the, there are places that have gone that bad. What are the technology besides that that ball you're you're describing? We have, we're working on foam cores in a paddle. The big the big thing is that every the, the US Pickleball Association as a certification process for all paddles. And for a player who wants to play tournaments, their paddle has to be approved in order to play in a tournament. They don't take into account sound. They take into account ball speed coming off the paddle, uh, spin, if it's too rough, you're only allowed to have it so rough, and size. So now they're coming up with a whole other category is the quiet category. And there'll be paddles and there'll be balls that'll all fall within that. And all fall, they're going to set the threshold, I believe, somewhere around 80 decibels or lower. And therefore, we'll get that into play. And that, that's when places will have a list. Only these paddles are allowed to play. They're trying to come up with specific colors so that if, for example, if Dave's driving by and everybody's using this bright orange ball, everybody's conforming to the rules. 
if someone's out there with a yellow ball, well, then you know that's not a quiet ball. So they're going to make it easy so people can enforce these rules. But it is, it's obviously it's an ongoing problem. I, you know, I just did a story last night, two nights on KDKA, and Andy Sheen was doing it. And it was on sound and was also on some other things that are happening up in Cranberry. But uh, they were talking about how it's taking over and it's noisy and so forth. So he was doing a story on that. It is a big problem. When when do you um, think that that will be available, readily available to people? There are some that will probably be available within the next year, especially this 3D ball. It's really, it looks like a, I guess the best way to describe it, if you know Star Wars and the Death Star, I mean, that's what it looks like. It's, it has this little thing, and it, but it bounces. It, it's crazy. You look at it, and this doesn't bounce, but it bounces really well. And... I guess the problem is now, can we mass produce these or can we sell these at affordable cost? How much is it going to get the cost down? It's still in its infancy stage, but there are softer balls out there. That's, that's the other thing. It, you can make a pickleball wider by making it softer, but then it doesn't play exactly as a harder one does. So most players prefer a certain ball. Is there any, um, and I know we talked a little bit about it um, in the previous meetings about starting a, a Mount Lebanon sort of pickleball association? I, I've put, I've tried that, and I, and I have on my Facebook page, I've got like 500 people. Mm -hmm. And well, what are we going to do with it, though? That's the thing. I mean, that's what I, I wanted to do that. And by doing so, you can grow it and you can do lessons and you can do clinics because there's a, there's a high demand for that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. As Dave knows, when last year at this time, we did, well, I think, 12 hours of clinics. At least. We did 300 people. We signed up in minutes. It was sold out. And we did free clinics. And it was great. And half of them came without a paddle and because um, the demand's there. But... I think the benefit with communication is one I, and your and your Facebook page is an excellent way of doing that. But when we talk about changing the rules to get that information out to that community, when we were asking kind of inquiring about should we change the rules, how what would be the backlash if we you know decrease the time we would be we would have somewhere to go to ask to get to get an answer to that. Also going forward, trying to get more pickleball courts in Mount Lebanon and where's the best place to put those and thinking through some of the concerns like noise, which I don't know that people realize that would be an issue until it was an issue. Um, that kind of thing, I think would be beneficial if there was an association. It's very easily done. It's just a matter of getting everything organized and coming up with the, you know, with the right, the 503, all this stuff and mm -hmm. get it all, and just like the paddle association. Right, and it would go hand in hand with that, then like the racket center sure. could become, you know, have tennis, paddle and um, pickleball kind of under that umbrella. If that's something you want to do, I'd be happy to help in any way to get it started because I have quite a few people in Mount Leather that would be interested in sure. participating. And um, it's, I don't want to say it's a major problem. There's a, what happens is Mount Lebanon built courts, so everybody from townships that don't have courts come here. Right. Now, Bethel built 10 courts, everybody, they're full already. I mean, 10 courts are constantly over all, right off the Baptist Road. You know. So that's what it does. It shifts all the way around, all around the city. And, uh, you know, until Tosh, every township has it. it. You look at what was done on, on Forsyth Road. I don't know if you've seen them when you go down. They're never used because they were done the wrong surface. They're beautiful. I, I I was curious why they didn't, from the road. Somebody said they don't, that doesn't bounce well. It doesn't bounce. It's What's work with Sport court? Yeah, it does um, not work at all. I drove down, and as soon as I saw it, I understood then why they were empty, because you know, they should be full, mm -hmm. and they're not. So that was a big mistake. So yeah. There's a lot that everybody, when you get to make these decisions, you have to reach out to as many people as you can, because sometimes what looks nice doesn't work. Doesn't work. Right. But you spend yeah, thousands. No yeah. Yeah. So, but if I can make contacts out to Bob Unitus, you know, this guy that it's in the side sound mitigation. I'd be happy to do anything if we need to pursue this even further, but I can see how the lights work, see how the eight o'clock start works. And I think going forward, I think I think the pricing is gonna 
not work for any like sound mitigation, but I think the the, the ball racket uh, strategy is going to be the way to go with that. Well, even today, before all this sound stuff started, there are communities that have certain paddles that are banned because they are just too loud and they sound different. You can tell when someone's using them, they're extremely loud and you can put a list, only these paddles are allowed to play, but then you have to have someone there to enforce it. Sure. That's the downside. So, but like I said, I'm like five minutes from here. I can help to help in any way I can. As Dave knows, I'm, I'm I'm a tennis player, but I'm also a pickle player. So I'm for both. So <laughs> I don't want anyone to get confused. Uh, I'm for both, but I think that uh, it has to be done right, and you have to take into account the noise, the crowds, all that stuff. So. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much, Thank Chuck. Pleasure. Thanks, Chuck. All right, thanks. Good to see you. I, just, well, yeah. I think the only unaddressed concern that we heard a little bit more about was parking in the area. And I feel like that's not really our issue. I that's the police that enforce parking. Well, we are going to review the parking restrictions, signs, striping. Um, and I actually added a rule to the pickleball rules just to make sure as an effort to help, you know, please, cars. please park legally or you may be ticketed or towed. Yeah. Um, then at least we can say, you know, we, we advise them not to. Well, do I think that. if you just, you know, if they go down there and write a couple tickets where it's going to get around and they're going to stop. Well, I know one at least has been written. <laughs> That was conveyed to us. Um, what's that? Where there's the? I just want. Is that a pain? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and oh, that's just us. I don't know what we're hearing. Okay. Um, we'll move on to the arboretum subcommittee. I don't think there's anything to report at this moment. I think that uh, Andrew has coordinated something with the 10 million trees. Right. And I don't know that he has a date yet. Okay. So. Can you get in touch with you? No, if you guys could just let me know. I, yeah. I know I wasn't at the last one. I realize um, I need to call. Yeah. So. I said a couple comments. If I if I know where I think he's getting the trees, you know, if you promote handing out that many free trees to residents, the, the main question is, are in my mind is it's always is it the right tree in the right place so knowing the size of the lots everywhere if we hand out you know 300 some oak trees that are going to be a problem you know then that that's really not helping you know that, that's just my my I thoughts agree. on it I, but, agree. I, think so, I think it's important to know what you're getting and sometimes with those mass distributions um from those great companies um you may not know what you're going to get until it comes. Yeah. And you, you see a lot of oaks and a lot of things that might not be, you know, what we want to be given out to residents along with, the, you know, an educational piece on it. So just that, that was my only comments when I just watched and heard a little bit on that. So, but I'll, I'll get with you guys and we'll, uh, we'll look at it. Educational stuff was discussed about being distributed. Yeah, and then, you know, right now, the plant. Yeah. 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 And of course, we wanted to run that all past you and your department, we, yeah. and this, including a location for where to pick them up and right. where to have them shipped and all that right. stuff. Okay, we'll look forward to hearing something next month. Okay, moving on to old business. The first item is a field census update. It looks like there's a printed copy of this study in, the, in your packet. So if you have not had a chance to look at it from the share drive, it is there. Um, I think we, we've been having some small group discussions on next steps, trying to figure out uh, where, where we go from here with this. Um, and I think the Gateway has been asked to update the numbers for um, developing the family park, which came out of this study. Yeah. So what, they're, they're doing it or they have already? They are in the process. Okay. Um, I don't, they're not done yet. Yeah. Um, but as soon as they are and I have more details, I'll definitely bring them. Sure. Yep. Um, so anybody else have any questions about that? I think that's all we have to share. And if and at any point you could review this tonight and you have questions, just shoot me an email and I'll be happy to answer anything um, that comes up from that. 
I'm curious that as like, to how did the data get gathered for usage for the fields when they did the study three years ago? So we interviewed, we gave surveys out to every youth organization that uses a field and they answered all the questions we had about how often you did use it. We also have the schedule. So there's, there's a grass schedule that you know who has, it, we did it based on permitting. So who has permitted the stadium, every field, the stadium, the, the cedar turf, the upper practice field, all the grass fields so we could divided by organization sport. Um, That's some good data in there. Yeah. 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 Also through the high school, middle school, school district. Yeah, oh, yeah, it was a school district as part of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. anybody who permitted the field, including the detailed version. Like at the, at the field meeting, you just see sort of the school district has it, but we dialed into who at the school district had it. This is a really good comprehensive study and it really highlights kind of the need. Had there been any changes with like the tier one Volunteer, like with you know better use of what we have. Um, I already. think there's been more cooperation from this. I think that the dialogue has opened up between the different groups as we've done this and met with each of one of them because we did present this back to each group um, in I think two or three different joint meetings. So that was like a table of you might have softball, field hockey, lacrosse sitting at the table hearing the report. So that I think opened up some dialogue for sure. Nothing specifically has happened on the low hanging fruit of the stadium pricing. Um, but there's definitely conversations happening about getting some of that stuff and start kind of, you know, knocking those out. Yes. You know, because they're, they're such low cost. Yes. Versus and in the interim, because we're really looking right. kind of down the road at something. Yeah. Right. And we have fixed some of the, the start times. Um, we went back to the school district and now the start times are the same at all the grass fields. Um, so that's, and that's picked, we picked up at least an hour. Yeah. Some fields we didn't start till six when they really could have started at four thirty. So we've picked up some time that way. So there's definitely, I think people are more cognizant of of using it wisely, but nothing like the the process is still very similar. It hasn't changed. Or just managing the time and space right feels better. Right, and people have been much better. I think attitudes have changed about giving back time you're not using and offering up. Hey, I'm not using this. Does somebody need it or? I know with, with the scheduling I do for two organizations, we definitely are sharing space. I just sent an email out tonight. Somebody needs to shuffle. What, what can we do to help get them the space they need for a specific day? So that's gotten better for sure. But there's still a lot of work to be done. And I think there's a lot of um, sort of side conversations happening with different people trying to figure out the best way to go forward. Um, and I think that, I mean, it, I think it, it's engaged the individual rec programs with the recreation department as well as the school district, which prior to that did not, they were, it did not, Same. could not accept. Everyone's kind of working in their own silo. Right. And so now you're looking at like, Phil's looking at like field um, repair, field upkeep, field maintenance, the closing of fields and inclement weather, all these things were done independently and not really well. Right? So all, I think as people understand they're at the table together, it's, it's a very different conversation, which is, which is helpful. And just opening people's eyes, talking about maintenance. Somebody sent me a picture of Jefferson Field, which is in rough shape right now. But every night, somebody's on it from 3.30 until dark. When do you want them to oversee? Like, what do you want the school district to do? There is no time for anyone to do anything on the field because it is constantly in use. So you can't expect, you know, maintenance people to be overseeding. Like, you were able to rotate in Brafferton on a football field where you're playing football games and soccer games. You can't. You can rotate for practice and we recommend that to people, but you can't rotate if you're playing games on a full field. So there's literally no time. And, and the, when the season's over, so is the season for planting grass. So that's the struggle until, until you have a little bit of excess capacity to get people to move around and move off a field for a week or two to get them to do some maintenance. There's not a whole lot that can be done about the field and conditions itself. And we had situations where field hockey would go on after baseball and it would take them 20 minutes to take down the, fence so 20 minutes of their hour was taking it down and the next team came in i mean it was just constant so they they start to get smart to figure out what is the cycle of what makes the most sense in terms of equipment and on the field so it, it's opened up a lot of conversations between the different associations and groups yeah we, we've scheduled speaking of the cheerleaders that were here for flag football we've scheduled the cheerleaders to take up a field, one of our empty fields closest to where softball needs to set up next. 
because then they can be setting up as cheerleaders are leaving and we're not waste, waiting for the field to be taken down. Just little things like that, save 15, 20 minutes, get everybody started, get everybody scheduled a little bit tighter without, you know, just to, to share in that setup to take down space. So there's a lot of that happening. I think really much more than there was three or four years ago. And sure. that requires people to be aware of what's going on. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Two other quick questions. As far as the tier one opportunity to utilize the stadium, it's the biggest opportunity. And this was done three years ago, 21, 22, right? This study. What's been the school district's aversion? Are they pushing back on usage of the stadium? And then secondarily, what's the pricing component that, that is referenced in the document? How does that work out? Well, the pricing is very complicated and it's not it's not easy to get like a straightforward Are price. Waiting for them to get price to yeah, I think we I think we need to work with the school district to to come up with a pricing scheme that's a little sim more simplified and a little clearer as to what you're paying. And I will say the in the fall, this fall, there is not a lot of capacity. Um, the, the school district is using it way more than they used to. Um, so it's pretty full this fall. In the spring, that's it, Sundays, I would say in the fall, that's less so. And in the spring, it's used a little bit less. But the school districts added a lot of programs as well. So since 2021, they've added, think about what they've added yeah, since then. Six varsity and like maybe six. They've added, club. I mean, there's middle school, boys and girls, they're soccer, they're, they're, there's they're, they're, ultimate they're, frisbee, they're rugby. Raising prices spring. across the board on all facilities. Um, that's, that's a fact. Okay. Have they shared any of that with you guys? No, and, and we haven't had, I, we, we had one conversation when we presented this information to the superintendent and she was op definitely open to, to looking at the pricing okay. again. And that's something that she needs to recommend to the, the school board and the school board approves all that pricing. Because if you're, and I guess this is the question, if, if it's a question or a matter of them reducing the pricing, that isn't going to happen. Right. Well, I think I think there's an argument to make it happen if you can show that it, your usage will go up and your total it income. It raises the fees for rental facility, leasing all facilities across the district. They announced that. So right. Yeah, there was a there was a correlation that we showed at what point if they reduced it to with the increase in participation would actually provide more income, and it was significant too. Yeah. To the life and the other thing too, Pat, is the life cycle doesn't change. The where, I mean, that it's the time, the years of play. So they're not going to get more life out of it by not using it. And I think that was one of you asked what the concerns were. That was, that, that was one of them. But I think the cedar turf has shown if you maintain it, it's what one, two, three, almost three years past the original uh, right. warranty, and it's used a hundred percent of the time. I mean, it's used at about as much as you could possibly use it. So we've shown that though that doesn't impact your. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I had one quick thought when I read about the, the school pricing, and which was whether that was based on any kind of empirical data that it takes, you know, ex janitor hours at fifty bucks an hour or whatever. That's or, part of it. Or there's just some number that they hit their super. It's always been, and I'm making up a number, sixty bucks a. Right, and that those numbers have gone up. So there's this definitely a supervision number, and there's um. And there's janitorial staff, depending on what you're doing. And that's the thing. It's 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 like there's not a flat fee. There's all the add-ons. Are you using the scoreboard? Are you using the lights? Do you need a supervisor? Do you need the bathrooms open? All that stuff adds to the price. So you, it's really hard to say, like, it's $200 an hour to run the stadium. You don't really know that. If you're doing a practice, they'll, they'll only charge you the same rate as the upper practice field. If you're doing a game with people and concessions and lights, that score scoreboard then it's change cha change cha change and then it adds up but and i think the one thing too which was a goal and i think an opportunity still is the cedar turf rate per hour was different than the upper practice field which was different than the stadium so in many cases people were going to the lesser cost surface uh which that was there's an opportunity to better be better aligned with yeah with costs i think some of the costs now are, are really below right you would figure I mean, part of that is that we can raise the price of the, the other turf fields. They're very low. Um, not so high to be prohibitive, but there's definitely we're leaving money on the table in that regard. Can you get the usage rate on the, you know, the main the yeah. field yeah. and yeah. with the additional sports that are there now? I mean, do we know we could numbers? we could take a look at the we just, could update those stadium numbers with just by getting the schedule for the past year. I mean, it's, we could do it for 2024 when 2024 ends and compare. 
to see if it's changed. I think it definitely, in the spring it has, because I know they've added rugby and flag football this past spring. So that's two sports that are were not there before. Um, and I think Ultimate Frisbee has started, I don't know if it started right before we did that. I think it was right before we did that. So they might've been included, but the, the rugby and flag football are definitely oh, new in the last few years. Girls? Both girls. A lot of good information in there. Thank you. It's, it's well written and it's there's a lot of hours into that. So yes, <laughs> I can confess to that. <laughs> um, any uh, okay, so we'll we'll move on. I'm sorry, just real quick. Oh, sure. Um, first off, yeah, I, I congratulate the uh, the, the work on it from the previous sports advisory board. It was very well done. Um, I pulled up some census data. And uh, in 2022, there are about 8,800 kids between zero and 19. I think the census had it broken out. And we've got 55, 21 participants, realizing some of those students, or some of the kids are in multiple schools. Yeah. Yeah. So like double counting, but that's like 63%. So that's, yeah, uh, so no, that, that's a lot. The other question I have, and then we can move on, is. Matter, are you thinking that this reconstituted board will at some point adopt all or some of this as policy recommendations or what's your vision moving forward? Um, I think, I don't know <laughs> how to say that, what I think. Um, I think that there is a lot that can be done. I think it's gonna end up being done by forming a different, a, a, another organization. I think one thing that is definitely, uh, I would like to see come out of this is forming the, what's mentioned in the thing, the Lebo Sports Partnership as a nonprofit organization that serves as an umbrella organization to all the sports organizations. And we can start with fields and people who use fields, but I would ideally like to see anybody who has a sports organization in the community be part of this umbrella. There's hundreds of ways that this can be useful um, in terms of sharing information, as we heard from the beginning, that dealing with bylaws, accounting, insurance, storage, clearances, all these things that all these organizations are doing, um, but having best practices shared. And this can be done again with field sports. We can add in wrestling, swimming, hockey, all the racket sports, youth, adult, like there's so many ways that you can look at this. So I think that's definitely one. I would like to see that happen outside of building new fields and scheduling. Um, that's a sep separate component that has to be developed between the school district and the municipality. And I think the push is to have those two organizations work together and figure out the best way um, to, to take on some of these recommendations. Those are joint efforts that have to be made because they're the ones who own the properties they own uh, they, and they have all the legal um, and the two and the commissioners and the school board have to agree and vote on all various components. So I don't think there's a ton that we as a board can do in that regard. We can help guide them and um, serve as advisors to that part of the project. Um, but I think a, a separate entity has to be formed, uh, a, a sports partnership that would, again, be with all that it would almost be like a new sports board, but it would include everyone, not just the nine seats at the table. Have you modeled that, that over like another community? Have you seen that or, or I maybe? have not. And that's something we should probably look into. I know every community has its ups and downs and <laughs> and politics and all that stuff going into the, the youth sports. And I know Upper St. Clair has a little bit of a different model. Um, but I can I, that's definitely something we can start to look at what other communities do. And I think when we initially built this to go to the commissioners was the representation of use to explain the, the actual how the facilities are used, what purpose, numbers, ages, you know, the, the, the K through four, what drops off and what picks up. And I think it's fair to say that it was the first time, at least the response was the first time that they actually had data from all these entities from the rec department, from the rec, from the rec programs, from the high school and middle school. And, that they actually pull together to understand uh, how they were being used. So I think to your point, Tom, is if we can continue to provide accurate data for decision making, I think that would be the best role we could play because that, that's going to indicate investments in facilities and resources and 
maintaining um, the, their best best utilization of what we have, or be you know as we look to expand what what areas. And we had a you know in the meeting we would say you don't need to do a study on what needs to be done. We can tell you that we we know the data of what type of field or what type of surface based on the data. Um, you know the where, the how, the space, location. Yes, but there's no 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 research needs to be done to come back and say we need more space for flag football or for field hockey or for some of these developing sports. I think if John Grogan were in the room, he would tell you he's unable to add programs at the high school and middle school level because of speed field space. Well, he's adding them, and then it's 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 but it's putting a strain on it. It's putting a strain on. Uh, we saw it this fall for sure. Um, youth football was definitely impacted this fall in terms of the amount of time they could get in the stadium, um, which then in turn impacts cheerleading as well because those are happening in conjunction. So, and some of that is due to middle school middle school sports. So, um, we just want to keep letting we we don't want to turn kids away. We don't want to turn programs away, but we have to also consider what we the you know the assets that we have. Man, is there like a short list of some of the um, improvements that this plan recommends that could be uh, recommended by this board to be implemented, um, particularly ones that, you know, are budgetarily, you know, dependent. Um, you know, you've already done the projects list where we have, you know, sheriff and lights for um, Middle and Seymour. But there's probably other, at least I think, initial things that you could pull out of here, and you know, the board could make a, rec a recommendation to implement those. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just just glancing. You know, well the 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 uh, field fees are too low, so that's something that could be recommended to be changed it would we'd probably want to make sure the school district was in sync with the right. same fee so that we're right. not fighting over undercutting you know they're right. going to go to the lower cost field or Don't want to do that. whatever it's just one that jumped out at me immediately that could be implemented it, we've looked at that the amount of money that's being spent outside of the community by associations and by programs at other fields i mean that was more of like get it not to the point where it's so ex excessively expensive we would do it but there is a there is a way to create more income to offset future expense of maintaining or replacing. Right. right. And so maybe it's increase it, I don't know, five dollars and then that increases your mark for yeah. field improvements or I don't I can take a look at it yeah. and see and, and also pull it out from the from the municipality's point of view as well. Because I think that's part of this is there's a lot uh, a lot that this school district related because so many of the fields are school district fields, but there's definitely things that just the commissioners could look at specifically and do that. Yeah, we could do that for the next meeting. Okay. I'm not recommending what I'm about to say, but I'd be curious that it be looked at is whether the grass field should also have some modest fee with that funding earmark towards maintenance. <laughs> that's where I don't disagree with you. And that's one of the things uh, yeah, that I don't we know talked that's a good about. Idea or not, it, the problem with it is, as, as David's face head starts to explode, <laughs> is the tracking and the, the, administ the, the, right the administrative yeah. component of that is so onerous right now that it, he, I'm not sure there's a lot of bang for your buck in terms of what you would be able to really charge for a grass field. Sure. I think um, that's where the fields are comes in if you want to do something like that. Yeah. Um, if you have um, something never, specific job is that, then you could they can do it. Until the installation of the turf, we didn't monitor on an hour for hour basis an invoice for any field. Um, it was just sort of a uh, like a, a, a season long schedule. Baseball has Monday from five to seven on Dixon or whatever it is. And that was it. Like we put together one page schedule. If we, and, and on the turf, it's completely different because people pay by the hour. It, it's different organizations every night. Um, their hours vary every, every Saturday that they're on it practically. And we book and invoice and collect every single one of those time slots and adjust by the way as needed we typically don't adjust for rainouts on turf because we 
there just are so few and the fee is so low that we don't provide a, uh, an adjustment for that. But, you know, if you book a huge tournament a month or two out and you find out it's not even feasible, then we would probably make adjustments there. Or it's mid season and you want to give back because you miscalculated. We may work with you if we know someone else is going to move into that time slot. So anyway, my point is, just that addition alone with those two fields is is a big undertaking. If you were to add, you know, we have five municipal fields, but I and then I don't know what this. I, I think the school district would would find that a little taxing as well to bill for every grass field. Yeah. Um, again, I wasn't pushing for that. I was just curious, and obviously, we talked about one time doing a participant like a, a sign up fee. If you sign up, it's four dollars per person, and that would go towards. Facility maintenance or field maintenance or offset some of the, the yeah, something that like that. That's simple. It says if, if Team X wants to use the fields this fall or whatever, there's a you know three dollar four dollar right. per child. I think that would be an easier approach. Something easier, right? Yeah. And again, I'm not pushing for that. I just seems like it's from seventeen to zero, and it seems like a big leap. Whatever. Beat this to death tonight. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on. Review McNeely Park recommendations from the Mark Parks Master Plan. The only reason I left this on here from the last time was just so that the request to get an updated plan and uh, cost estimate from Gateway wasn't lost. Right. So you kind of beat me to the punch. So I don't think there's really anything else to add to that. Yeah, I okay. think that's really the thing that you're looking for, not trails and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, I. My vision for it is to have a, both passive and active recreation in there. I think that would be the ideal. Yeah. yeah. And and I, I think Gateway's plan can include those other amenities in right. addition to fields and right. whatever else there is. But the cost of the of the trails isn't the deal breaker. No, no, no. No, <laughs> no, so, it's no it's not. <laughs> I think just getting it flat is yeah. gonna be the <laughs> that's gonna be the pricey part. Um all right, we'll move on to new business. So we're going to start with what's on here, and then I think we have a couple items to add. Um, the first is a proposal to rename Middlefield. So it, it, prior to the board's uh, merging, we had a proposal that was presented to the board on the renaming of Middlefield. Um, and at that time, the document, there was a naming criteria document that was specific to the sports board um, that has since been uh, reviewed, David, and approved September 3rd, 2024. Uh, there's a new document that's reflective of the Parks and um, Recreation Board uh, as far as what is the process for that to happen. So uh, as I said to David, at the next meeting, uh, I will present the formal uh, proposal for that, but we will also share the criteria that's been updated and what is the process in which um, a, rec a recommendation is made by this group to the commissioners um, to rename a field. So it just outlines that. And, um, it was something that was was started almost at the end and we, we needed to pick that back up. And so we'll, we'll revisit that, but. Yeah, I can drop the policy in like the next meetings folder just so you all can review it. It's pretty short. It's not a, you know, a 20 page document. It's just a process that, that you know includes one of the initial steps is getting a petition with is it two hundred signatures? It's two, yeah, two, two years of if, it, if it's for someone that's deceased, it's two years from the date of deceased. There's two hundred fifty signatures. There's yeah. letters of recommend. I mean, there's a variety of things that are a part of that. But but the part that affects this board is the recommendation is now is is uh, to come through this board so uh, you would hear the proposal and then make a recommendation or not in favor of the um, naming proposal so uh, i'll put that in there just so you can see the language but it's a it, the policy the only thing that was changed is the the boards that it would go through previously it was sports or parks now it's through parks and rec board and there are and not within the time frame of the 24 months, but there are two others that have since come regarding other currently non-named areas. So you know we could present those as well for discussion. So 
I don't want to get into the details and take up a lot of time. I'm just curious, is there a financial component? A lot of times there's a financial ask. So there's, as, as they define it, it's a financial consideration uh, or the naming opportunity as a result of financial contribution. So is it, a, is it, and I think it gets into the detail, what is the financial consideration as a part of it? So is it, is it the, um, it's not like they say, hey, you have to start here or else we don't even talk. No, Nothing it's like never that. been that way. But there are, there are, and actually, as we know, this started with the, the funding of the renaming and signage for all the fields. It's kind of where the, where the, the starting of that conversation started was that was the gift back to the community that the expense of, of putting field signage and park signage up would be covered by that person's name. So I think, I think it's, a, it's, it's bigger than just saying, here's a check. Um, it's what, what would be the overall impact to the community. And I think, David, it's fair to add that that, that aligns with the parks master plan, signage, wayfinding, all, all of that kind of sure. falls back into what the plan, master plan would be. It's, it's the, the policy is very flexible. Like there's no, hey, it has to be X number of dollars before you can be considered. There's really, it wouldn't even necessarily be a financial contribution, although I think that's probably helpful. Um, but there are many different criteria that would be considered. And then ultimately, it's the commission's decision whether or not to name that that uh, amenity. It does. This isn't limited to just fields, or it could be a facility, uh, an amenity within a facility, you know, a room or a fee, uh, court or something like that. So. I think I think there's two more items and I know of for new business and I'm going to do the one chair leaning first because they are sitting here waiting for us to say something about it um to add this to a line of, of, of business um since we heard from them tonight uh, personally I'm well versed in the issues with the cheerleading organization I helped work with them at the very beginning of the season to try to get all the kids that were on the wait list off the wait list um David when they said we were they were partners with the municipality is that what, what does that look like? Well, I guess just to maybe provide some history here, uh, cheerleading started as a recreation program. Okay. Um, we were approached by a mom, you know, with an idea. Um, we had a staff member that had some expertise in cheerleading. Um, I think we had a program recently drop off at that time, so we had some capacity. Um, so anyway, we started with the with the cheerleading program. It grew. And it was clear that we weren't going to be able to, um, you know, meet all their desires. They wanted to do more travel. They wanted to do more stunts. They wanted to do more other events. Um, and so, it, you know, it made sense for them to go off on their own. They wanted to go off on their own, and they did so with our blessing. Um, so they're not affiliated with us. Um, in any different way uh, than flag football or baseball. It's a community-based organization that, you know, uses some of Mount Lebanon's facilities. Um, there is no other relationship beyond that. So it, it's just like any other youth association. Yeah, that's the question I had um, more generally was, are there like, any kind of official relationships with the municipalities and any other 501c3 groups no. or anything that uh, no the only as a municipal corporation I mean we need to be aware of and like for example when no, we're not when we had the sports advisory the yeah. only criteria to be have a representative on that board was if you were a recognized sports organization so you know, if if you were known to Mount Lebanon as a um, a recognized sports organization, and I, I think that's just sort of taken at face value. You know, we know you collect reservations. We know our residents are the primary um, beneficiaries of the programs you offer, um, that kind of thing. Um, I don't, we never even stipulated that it was nonprofit necessarily, although I think probably everyone is, you know, so 
that's the only criteria I think that uh, like that would be the criteria if we're going to list you on our website as a a community organization, I believe is how they're classified on our website. And then we just provide a link to the organization. Does this advisory group have any authority or any, like we can't call the board people in and make them testify. I mean, no, you could, you could make recommendations to the commission, just like any other issue that's brought to this board. That would be the extent of your capability. Um, I guess it, you know, it's it's a um, it's a touchy issue, I guess, because we we don't dictate what uh, happens in youth organizations. They're self governed. We don't typically, or or I can't think of in in any instance. And maybe someone can remind me if I'm overlooking it. But you know, I've been here a long time. I I've heard many complaints about youth organizations, and they are you know, without exception, in my mind, resolved internally. Um, we've been asked to step in in the past. Um, we've declined to do that. And things seem to work themselves out. Um, you know, I'm not I, I'm not speaking on the uh, merits of the complaints that were brought to us today. I mean, I think, you know, what they're asking for seems reasonable. Um, it's just not typically something that we're we want to insert our state from a rec department or a municipal standpoint, something we want to insert ourselves in. You know, obviously, if there were some egregious activity that you know were taking place on our property, we would get involved. Um, uh, so that's I don't just know sort of where my they practice, but I think they're primarily on a school district. Yeah, and they asked to be on the field contact sheet, and I'm sure you've seen it there for, for several years now. I don't recall maybe one meeting that was attended by cheerleading, and I don't know that I've seen a representative since. Um, I don't, I have, I can't recall a um, response. For all I know, I don't even have the right rep on the sheet. Yeah. Um, I don't know. They, I, I mean, I guess they, they use facilities under the umbrella of tackle football and 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 flag football so they do use cedar field because we have some games there where they're sure. they're welcome to come and cheer right and that was the case back when we ran right. the program we but were sort of at own, the mercy they don't it's not their insurance certificate on the permit right. it's not their it's it's the it's the organization who's permitting the field which would be the football organization I thought that they also had like practice time that they would i i don't know like I guess that's a question for you guys. Where do you practice? Yeah. Yeah. We're well, allowed to practice before the games. That's it. But they also, before the season started, said we can practice at any of these schools. Just go and practice in, in the front of... Oh, and and that's, they, they, they take non-permitted areas. Right, right. The, right, the, right. And the, and like the grassy area next to Dixon or the, sure. the front yard of Markham. Or, or one that we've talked about. Right. The, 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 gym. What? The, the competition team practices in the high school okay. gym. So they permit that through the school district. What we've talked about, and I think it outlines a little bit in this, I think the broader opportunity is when we look at if you look at spring sports versus fall sports, it's the same coaches, it's the same individuals, and they're getting clearances and the background checks and the safe sport and the insurance and the compliance. I think the conversation that we've had, and in most cases, every association has been super supportive of the idea of having that risk mitigation simplified, but it's 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 not done. You know, we, I think there's multiple uh, associations that have, have lost their 501 status this year, I think three or four. I know or two, two um, that have lost their, their just from lack of, of submitting documentation to it. Literally, like clicking three buttons. But yeah. yeah. So I think, you know, the 990 postcard, it's not even like a whole tax. While, while concerning it, it's not limited to one, I think. And that's what we've talked about is there is an opportunity to simplify and consolidate that across the board to address some of the concerns that Mount Lebanon would have or the school district would have with who's on the field and how it's being permitted. and. One of the challenges is when the high school permits a, a elementary or school or middle school or high school, it's permitted to in, to a specific team or specific association, mm -hmm. and that association technically can't 
offer it to another one because of the permit. I mean, you can, but it's the, it, people do. I think it, it's kind of agreed upon that if everyone's insured and everyone has it's to complicated. Yeah. It, so so the, the, the part of this is to make it easier across the the entire board. So. Well, this is an example. If we had a, a Lebo Sports Partnership and cheerleading had a seat at the table and they had a complaint against them, that we could we would have not so, so much authority, but at least we would have the ability to say, like, if you want to stay part of this organization and work with the football teams, then you need to do X, Y, and Z. I don't think that's established at this point. Um, I, yeah, so I don't know what really can be done. I mean, I could send a letter on behalf, but I, they already, I, it would be better if you did that than me, because I've already worked with them five to yeah. And offer time, and then but they tell everyone I didn't offer time, but I did offer time. So I I'd, I'd like to stay out of it. I've already inserted myself in it as much as I want to. So I, I think we could do a letter from the the chip. The, is that something that's uh, that's not something that's not allowed? Um, honestly, I don't know if that would be because we have to uh, look, at that and look at what we were charged to do. Like yeah, so because this is a municipal board, right. I think you have to be careful that you are. Um, I think there were some rules well, outlined at the very beginning. Yeah, yeah, we want to go back and consult those before a decision is made, right. I think. And um, Yeah, let's check that. I mean, I, I appreciate the residents who came and your comments, and I appreciate the time, and you wrote this document up, which I appreciate. I am not versed on what's going on with any of these sports, boys, girls, or anything, and, I, and that's good. Um, and I don't think we have any legal authority. And uh, these are self-governing associations, and they usually work them, these problems usually work themselves out. In this case, it sounds like it, it isn't being worked out, and they are coming to us, this board, in our capacity to step in and arbitrate, uh, not to take over and not to be the heavy hand. But they're not getting email responses. They're not getting um, acknowledgement of the whole myriad of things they listed. Um, it would seem like it, this board, and then I, I think I read, I mean, we're supposed to like take feedback and commentary from residents and assist if we can. Um, and um, they think we do list all these organizations on the website as partners. That's probably a loosely worded term, but it is listed. They're all listed. Youth organizations are listed. The 501c3 is a little concerning, but I, I mean, um, I, I just I just think I, I think we should consider. I understand if we do it for one group, we have to do it for the next group and the next group and the next group. But that's okay. We that's where we are. Sports, the Parks and Rec Advisory Board. That's just my opinion. Yeah, we can take they're a look at they're looking for help. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I would agree with that too. I think that you know they're um it's deserving of a seat at the table, essentially. Yeah. You know, it needs to be kind of looked at. Um, you know, it is a, a youth program that is part of the community um in different kind of facets, whether it be whether it's like competitive, you know, or not. But I, I think it should we should explore that. Yeah, I think we talk. We maybe need to go back and take a look at the original uh, document about what our parameters are um, and what we can do from that. I think that would be my recommendation, um, and, and take a look at that. Um, I, I don't, and, and the David, I don't have any recollection of any of this kind of precedent for this. The only thing I can think of is for flag football when tackle football decided to drop the flag football program, people just started up a new one. And that's how flag football started. We started up our own organization to 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 because the old one didn't want to do that. So it, it would be like if the cheerleading organization decided they didn't want to have competitive cheer or somebody started a competitive cheer program. Mm -hmm. I think if the if the current board, um, which I've heard rumors is planning to resign at the end of the season, if that doesn't happen, I think the best course of action for them is to start a start a new organization. Um, and I think they would get plenty of people to follow them. So um but we can definitely take a look to see what, what we can do about it. Yeah, I mean, that's in your uh, in folder time. called onboarding. Um, you could all yeah, take a look at that and see what makes sense and just maybe talk about it some more. Yeah, you just add it to the old business next time. We'll, we'll get, get yeah. um, so what would we what would we call this topic? Um, you want to think it is 
you know, youth cheer concerns or yeah. just overall? Okay. That's fine. Is it youth, youth sports in general or that? Or I think it's it specifically youth. chair? Chair. I think it goes back to Pat's issue is, is what is the authority and what's the purpose of our role in advising commissions on these concerns for any, for any, for, yeah, we need to for anybody. Yeah, I mean, an arbiter, an arbiter to, to try to. We, we offered, we offered, I offered that at the beginning, along with the, uh, one of the people who runs the youth tackle program to try to get help and it was not good with. Yeah, it really goes towards you know, the man and the previous board's suggestion for the the need for a institutional infrastructure to organize and manage the institutional aspects of the youth sports. I mean, I see I, our role is somewhat involved in that, maybe, but you know, we're more to advise the commissioners on budgeting and broader policy and you know, resource utilization kinds of stuff. Youth sports umbrella organization, youth sports oversight. <laughs> what do we talk about? <laughs> I agree. We don't want to really get into the detail like you're saying. I agree with you. Maybe it's as simple as convening a meeting and just seeing if we can pull all the parties together. And, and, and Pat, we know we know from meeting with the data points, everyone's interested in the concept of sharing and making it simple. And, you know, from a standpoint of saying, give us a portal where we can put our minutes. Tell us where we can put our bylaws. Tell us where we can put our insurance tell us like where all this is available i mean so i think there's common ground for a lot of the programs that have that and fortunately and unfortunately you know it's what every year every two years leadership changes and sometimes it's never changing and so uh, we hear that where, where, where are the bylaws where are the minutes where's the insurance policy for for people to look at so i, I think that that's i think maybe a recommendation we should focus on with the commission is there should be a portal all of the, anyone utilizing yeah. a field or a service. I agree. I don't think we should insert ourselves into what's happening internally with that organization, but at the same time, there needs to be that availability to have access to, you know, practice places, to, you know, to practice that are um, permitted, you know, that type of thing. So, you know, how does that fit? Maybe it's, maybe it's defined as an association in good standing would have access to field utilization. Right. So we, you know, again, the recommendation would be this is what would this is what constitute an association of good standing. Yeah. Okay, we're going to move on to the last item. I think it's the last item of new business. Uh, Pat, what did you you have something? Yeah, to I'd like to introduce a new piece of business. Um, uh, there, there's been discussion on the. Uh, construction of a couple, there's a lot, of, a lot of discussion on the parks master plan and things related to the municipality, parks and fields. There's also a school district issue that they, they're going to need a new stadium. Um, so I've, I've been thinking about could we merge the two projects at a high level um, the stadium is going to stadium is, is deteriorating to the point where it's going to have to be replaced. I'm talking about the side closest to the rec center. It's been announced. It's publicly announced. Um, at the same time, the parks, uh, uh, you know, we're looking at a, a new rec center, perhaps. And there, I know the parks master plan mentions different locations, different sites, different costs. There's been a lot of good work done in that. So, my thinking is. Um, could there is there is there a discussion to be had to 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 merge both projects and to integrate the new stadium construction again the the side closest to the rec center on that like the hill there and integrate the new rec center into that construction site literally the same site the same building the same location um, the the reason for that is is multiple benefits. Um, you sharing resources, you're merging knowledge, expertise, you're sharing engineering, architectural engineering firm dollars, you're having maybe one firm instead of two, one construction projects instead of two. Um, you could deliver and knock out two projects in one fell swoop and maybe save the taxpayers money at the same time. This is just an idea. 
And I've, I've talked to Amanda, I've talked to Tom, I've talked to Craig Grell about it. There's there's already discussions about partnering with between the municipality and the school district to combine forces and utilize the talent and the resources we have to, to save the township money, save the taxpayer money, but continue to provide for these facilities that we all know that's coming. So I, I put together a little write-up that kind of talks about all this at a high level. I'm going to give it to everybody, but um, you know, Amanda mentioned a university project that has done similar type of stuff next to their stadium. Stadium, you know, building with academic buildings, and there's some pretty, you know, our neighbors to the south of us, who we will name, we will not name, has done a pretty nice project over there in the last couple of years. Similar, it's right next to the stadium. Ours will be better. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of benefit um, to consider. I haven't done the numbers. I know I knew, uh, the, the projected numbers for the new stadium is 20 million. That there's a there's an $8 million option, a $15 million option, and a $20 million option. For the for the uh, rec center, there's a $30 million option, $47 million option, and maybe an $85 million option. So I'm saying let's put them all in one spot. It's less disruptive to the community. It doesn't um, disrupt the beauty and the natural habitat of the park as much. It's limited disruption. We want to save the you know the natural habitat, the beauty of the park, and save the taxpayers some money at the same time. The last component is the entities involved, which is the school district and the municipality, both have different bond rates. Who both of these projects are going to require floating a new bond for multi-millions of dollars. And, the, and you're going to get a rate from the for the bond. Each entity is potentially going to get different rates, maybe one worse than the other. The school district's rate's probably not going to be that good. Uh, the municipality probably will get a good rate. That's 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 my uh, that's my understanding. So could you partner these these two projects, merge them together, have a municipality school district partnership where they, they lead the municipality leads with one bond issuance to cover the whole thing at a more favorable rate and it saves, saves us all money uh, as a taxpayer, as a resident and a taxpayer. I love the central location for obvious reasons. It's accessible to more, more people in the community by foot, by bike, by car, um, and it doesn't uh, disrupt established driving patterns. So I, I wrote this up, I'm gonna hand it out to everybody. Um, that's at a high level and there's, there's some other details here. That's it. And I, I'd like to make a motion that we pull the stakeholders together uh, in a meeting, convene a meeting within the next X amount of time, the next few weeks, whenever it's convenient for everybody. It will add some, potentially add some time, but we want to do it right. Not, we want to do it, we want to do it right. And the stadium construction, the stadium issue had not presented itself at the time that the park's master plan was written. It's nobody's fault. It just wasn't a really known thing. So over time, that has now come to surface. That was announced in December of 23. The park's master plan was written in 21, 21, 22. It's nobody's fault. It wasn't a mess. But now that certain, certain situations present themselves, so we have more information, there's more need, there's an opportunity here, I think, to, to, to merge them both. David, That's where, it. Where are we with the, with the, I, I think I know, but I just want to clarify. So the, the, the consultants are working on a plan for the rec center. Yeah, and they they've presented some ideas and the commissioners have said, go back and yeah. bring us something else. It's a uh, main park at a master plan slash, slash rec center architectural study. So I say they are very close to done with their plan. We don't have the final document, but it's it's pretty well, I think, done. Okay. So that's I, that's so where I think it is. I think that mm -hmm. then for to think about this would be to to get for a rec, in terms of a recommendation would be to get that those consultants 
in a room with the school district architect or whoever has drawn up the school district plans and, and see if there's any. Um, mm -hmm. I'm kind of thinking we get the stakeholders together first without the engineers, just to see if there's any appetite. Yeah. Yeah. Because the engineers and architects, they're all going to want to do the job and they might, you know, well, I think do it this way. My concern that, that'll is all they, come over time. There will be time for that, but maybe just, initially it's just get the stakeholders from the school district, the municipality together, see if they're interested. I think too, though, that my concern is this gets presented and they start to run with it without ever considering that some of the that some of the problems I know parking let's say was an issue in the first few things that the consultants presented and everybody knows that the, that that's an issue you take up you add to the rec center as is you lose parking you got to make it up somewhere else um, people you know there's all different ideas about where to do that if you look at the high school and their bubble. They're short on parking for students. There's event parking. Parking could be integrated into this. And this. you could integrate parking into the new stadium, and that would solve yes, those people's problems. You could, so you could put a deck in there. The square footage that's the square footage is listed on the park's master plan for uh, the main park rec center option. The, the, the square footage is there that you could build the stadium, and underneath it, literally have a two-story rec center with parking. It should at least be discussed because the taxpayers could save a lot of money. So, so would it be fair for uh, for us to agree that we would reach out to the commissioners as well as the school district to seek their support in the concept first to understand I their, talked to their Craig. willingness? Greg said yeah. he's he wants to at least talk about it. Right. How, how, once I think we were able to gain their support, say yes, we we would like to get together, and I think it, it's a good way of bringing those groups to, to a central conversation for sure. I mean, it's Craig's one person speaking on behalf, but I think we'd have to understood. have the and honestly all the commissioners say yes, we support this concept to exactly. avoid totally. to avoid you know six it. months of planning, and then someone goes, yeah, now we're not doing that. I get it, but let's have that's how the initial discussion. If the, if their engineers want to be in the room, I, yeah, I don't really care. Maybe David, I could care a lot. Maybe it's a function of saying, is there any opposition or is there a proposed view to this conversation happening from the commission from the school district to? initiate it as opposed to spending time and not having consensus well i think pat essentially made a motion to have a stakeholder meeting to discuss possibility of combining two projects so i don't know if we there's have a second i don't know that we can have a stakeholder meeting until we have consensus from all parties to say yes you could have a it's not meeting. you wouldn't have a meeting you'd have a recommendation to have a meeting that would go to the our commission yeah and then they it's have, not then it's to, in their hand they right. have to have a meeting right. so, so there's a motion if there's a second and then a vote then it moves forward if there's not then it does not i'll second that. all in favor well, can, I, uh, can we clarify what what we're are we i see a couple of things that overlap one is we are recommending that the commissioners institute a stakeholder meeting to look at the possibility of a joint project which is fine or are we as the board recommending that we host or get involved in facilitating a meeting or, or what are, are there are good options um, I'm not, but it wasn't part of, okay, it's a good so, question. It wasn't part of, it wasn't, I wasn't thinking of that as part of the motion, but I mean, I, I think, yeah, I think the motion was just to recommend that the commissioners have a meeting with the school district about the, about this. Again. Yeah, that's right. It may go nowhere and that's fine. It's just a discussion. Uh, I think there's some merit to it. Uh, the school board is in the school district is, in, uh, They're not going to be able to address this in a manner that's um, financially. The way you stated it, Pat, we would be, we broadly speaking, would be remiss not to look at this yeah. potential cost saving. Yeah, let them figure Especially it out. When you think about the stadium, if you think about that hillside and the stadium is there, and didn't we just, I think I asked this question not long ago, 
the road that leads behind that stadium that access road is the bear like that's where it switches from school district to municipality property right the, so the volleyball courts the basketball courts those are all that's municipal property correct and only the stadium and that road is the school district i believe that is the property that is the line. only other piece of property that is on the municipal side that might not be clear is the commissioner's lot yeah that the school district uses for parking yeah, so during that's, part of it for that's, during the day. Yeah, there's a parking agreement for that yeah. to use it, but that's roughly the line without looking at the actual exactly, exactly. line. So it certainly makes sense if there's two large construction projects happening literally back to back. They might be a hundred yards away from each other. Talk to each other. Yeah, a hundred yards. Maybe. And maybe uh, less. <laughs> one less you construction could throw a ball project from one to the is other. better. And we have a skywalk from yeah. the <laughs> ice rink over to the stadium. So going back to the motion, so the motion is that we recommend that the commission has a meeting with the, the, the stakeholders being the school district and the municipality regarding the two pro joining of the two projects. So we had a second of the motion. So all in favor of the motion. Right. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion passes. Look at us with all of our recommendations. Who was the second? Thank you. All right. Any other? Um, I may the last. I don't know here. Any other um, new business that we didn't cover? <laughs> all right. The next me meeting is uh, of the Mount Lebanon Park and Recreation Advisory Board. It's Wednesday, October sixteenth at seven p.m. Um, and like all, we'll have the Zoom component, so you can attend in person or virtually. Um, and with that, we will adjourn at 8.46. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.